Hello there, everyone, and welcome to TNO The Last of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover, in which we are beginning our journey to play as the good old Reich's Commissariat Ukraine. Now, but we got to talk about Herzog's Rage. Reich's Commissar Kopp, as an exceptionally busy man with political duties in the Reich proper, and therefore cannot reasonably be expected to spend considerable time in Ukraine. This has been war since, or this has been true since the West Russian War. Yet the multitude of problems affecting the state cannot be denied, and so his presence is required for stabilization purposes. Despite his desire to be less involved and his clear anger at being forced to attend our administration, he is here as such. Just like in years prior, we can expect problems to be decisively addressed. Uh, Ukraine's destiny will soon be decided. Choose an option in the destiny's favor category. Let last, last one be chosen for you. Fuel the breadbasket. Ooh, more growth. Spend more money. Brutal quotas. Experimental extractionist methods are now available. Reinforce the strongholds. Well, that'd be good too. Let's fill the breadbasket. The purpose of Ukraine, of our administration as a whole, is to provide resources to the Reich. Coal, steel, much, yes, besides. But above all, this lies grain. Ukraine feeds Europe, and as we, the continent grows ever hungrier, so must we take steps to increase production and grain yields. The result is not in dispute. The only question is how to accomplish it. From all the corners of our government, there are ideas varying intensity, dedication, and thoroughness. We'll evaluate them and choose the best one suited to accomplishing our goal. Come to the past. Air Cock lingered in his office, surrounded by the folders of maps he did not care to examine. Outside, scattered footsteps rang out. The day was done, and Cock had to leave at any moment, yet he could not help but examine a single photo on his desk. A picture of the Reichs Commissar on the first day of his assignment. Where was he now? The Reichs Commissar was that fateful day when a train ripped him away from his native Prussia to serve in Rosenberg's newest colony. How hideous the land had, had seemed as it smeared past his cabin window, yet when the train arrived, the air was crisp and clean. Vernon Fields filled his view. For a single moment, it almost felt like a home. It was shameful how long he had strung himself along in that fleeting moment. How he had allowed his, his land to deceive him. To let him believe he could sculpt it into an area in paradise, no native starvation nor partisan massacre ever managed to bring back that sensation. When Cock came home that day, he would arrive in the stiff bed of, of a foreigner. Perhaps that is why the office brought more comfort. Twenty years later, the Rex Commissar remembered so little that day. Year by year, Cock had let that world slip through his hands. As the true nature of his colony crushed him, now he could barely bring himself to work at all. In that moment, Cock had felt like... Uh, Arthur was his to conquer. That violent, hopeful energy was gone now and gone forever. At the end of the day, Cock only wished he had done more. He wished he had found every Ukrainian who dared to speak, every liberal who dared to whine and rip their throats from their necks. If he had known then the world of dogs was, he was being shuttled into, he wouldn't have spent a moment in that dream. He wouldn't have dared to let himself be fooled. Two decades of meaningless violence and all Cock could think of was wading further into the blood. As if the blood didn't surround him already. Let's read about him. He's a Ukrainian's grave digger. Oh. Hurts our partisan desolation exploitation modifier. And a partisan control every act activity cycle. This is what Eric Koch has been left with. This is what he deserves. Let us speak of authority. Uh, Eric Koch was a thug upon a throne, brutal even by the standards of the Third Reich. His colonial policy was an endless cycle of exploitation and repression, designed to beat the Ukrainian people into submission. Under his watch, a hunger plan left the native population starving in the fields of amber, and his quarters reduced them to slavery in his mind. He had forged the very picture of Lebensraum, a blood diamond in Hitler's crown. It could not last, of course, in the wake of the West Russian War. The ex Commissariat was left with far more problems than Koch could apprehend. Above him, an army administrator demanded more and more, hoping to prop up the Reich's ailing economy with further blood from his breadbasket. Below him, a crowd of natives screamed, demanding freedom from the best he had created. For the first time, Eric Koch was faced with problems which he could not be solved with woods and hammers. The Reich's Commissariat was finally lost. Rather than attempting major change, the Reich's Commissariat left the colony stagnant beneath him, even as it terrorizes and private slow. Deep down, Eric Koch may be aware of some solution, but the man lacks energy to change Ukraine's fate and the new profit. The Reich's Commissariat ground his colony to sand now, he watches it blow away. Ukraine, to many, is the breadbasket of Europe, filled to the rim with rots and mold. Bearing the fruits of fertile soil, one would expect for Ukraine to prosper under the Soviets and at least endure the Reich. Yet now Ukraine's a graveyard filled with millions of dead, their dreams buried with them. The dream of a free republic, crushed before it could draw its first breath. The dream of national communism, obliterated in the storm of Barbarossa. The dream of Stepan Bandera, dead just like him before. Uh, the dream of national socialism, rapidly decaying. These dreams are dead, or are they? What will be given a second chance, a chance to shape Ukraine's destiny? Which dream will you choose? Favor the Rex Commissariat. A territory known as Ukraine is just one piece of granite design. German people, trapped in darkness for centuries, have woken under the word of the Fuhrer. They stretched their arms and strode through all of Europe, looking for the space their nation needs to thrive. They found it here in Ukraine in its golden fields and brilliant skies. Ukraine's freedoms are those which Germany seeks to give it. Ukraine's future is whatever path Germany provides. It may be kind, it may be cruel, but know that this is the truth. Ukraine's destiny is not her own. Favor the UNRA. Ukraine has never been free, or not truly, for hundreds of years. The closest our state came to freedom was in 1917, and that brief glimpse of freedom from the Russians, Germans, and despots. The days of Kukrevsky were a finest, and now they are lost to history, even that has slowly been forgotten. Yuri Hordalis has had no misunderstanding of what will happen if the revolution 
is broken on the back of the Bolsheviks and Nazis again, and it's determined to ensure such a thing never happens again. Should the Republicans win, freedom will return to Ukraine. Only time will tell how it is preserved, of course. In favor of the Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic. The Russian Revolution in 1917 was the greatest thing to happen to Eastern Europe in the 20th century. And as thanks to it, Ukrainian or Ukraine found itself living through the greatest national communist revolution of our time. From Bukharin's uh, allowance of the Ukrainianization program to the increased administration of the North Kuban regions, it seemed as though the Ukrainian socialist Soviet Republic had found a relatively golden age of peace and prosperity creeping its centralization to Moscow not with, notwithstanding. Now, of Ukraine lies broken pillage and chains. Alexander Shuminsky, now de facto leader of the USSR, now seems certain to free Ukraine under the velvet band of national communism. Guess how it will survive after is anyone's guess. Favor the OUN Bandera. Since the death of Konovalets, Ukraine has only known shame and defeat. The true nationalists rallied under the banner of Bandera just to be backed up by Melnyk and his cronies. The true patriots of the Ukrainian insurgent army have wallowed and felt and braved the harshest winners of for their father's cause. The ultra-nationalist Dmitro Klyachkivsky shall see that the Banderas will be done no matter the cost, for the revolution is uncompromising and the nation sort of needs discipline. His rage will bathe Ukraine in fire for a third and final attempt at victory, but how long the embers of hate can burn out is up to fate. But we do have a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm, but um, we're probably going to go with the Rex comes out in Ukraine just to see what that's like, because, I don't know, it seems like a default path for us. And we feel the breadbasket, and the breadbasket of the Reich. Oh, Jesus Christ. And that's a unique GUI mechanic that we got to talk about, too. Since the Reich's great triumph in the East, Ukraine has been the breadbasket of the Reich and its allies in the pact. With the city starved and its industries reduced to a rope bowl following the Second World War and the Hunger Plan, agriculture was all Ukraine had left. Ukraine is so hopelessly dependent on agriculture 20 years later, despite small developments in other sectors. It will remain so, uh, as that is what the Reich wants. The breadbasket will continue on harvesting, exploiting, and killing forever. Land of contrasts. Ugh. You Rex Commissar Ukraine is divided, not just between the Germans who rule the land and the Ukrainians who are ruled, but within the halls of the power as well. Erkok stands for hardline national socialist policy, for ruthless colonization, exploitation, for unending violence, but there are as many within the Rex Commissariat who see things differently. Leibbrandt's Gang of Rosenberg academics and collaborators, Ollendorf's and his allies in the SS, Brautigam's small but growing liberal clique, all propose a different vision for national socialism for Ukraine. Kok is surrounded by men who oppose them, but the question remains will they ever amount to anything? And paradise aren't done. Oh, Jesus Christ. Ukraine was a promise to be a paradise for the Aryan people. A lush land where one would not need to tilt a finger with to re reap great profits and wealth, and where the future of Germany could be built on the sun by her sons. A humble Aryan man with a peaceful farm for his family, free from all the degeneracy of urban life, life was it was meant to be. The dream died a slow, painful death, though. Millions were slaughtered, cities were left to rot, German settlements continued to be endangered, endless parts of warfare rendered Ukraine a hellscape, poverty, pain, and misery all around Ukraine is dying or is already dead. Mechanization in Nipper, Ukraine. Nipper mechanization finish off communal farms. Skip knock holdings. Hirima and his little company have no need for funds and must go to more important projects. I'm sure you will understand. Blood from a stone. Yeah, I understand that a lot. That'll keep the deputy busy. If LeBron cares so much for Slavic degenerates, he may actually jo actually do his job instead of whining. Reap the harvest. Or Rainfall Strongholds. Finish up the third phase of the GPO. And we gotta get them all done, so. <clears throat> Rainfall Stronghold, as it has for decades. The fight against banditry and lawlessness continues. We must support by enduring or ensuring firm control of the regions that we do hold in strength. Places where the Wehrmacht and Ostdeutsche have established themselves and where shipments of weapons and supplies can be trusted to be properly used. Rono, Kiev, uh, uh, Nikolaju, Hegewald. These are places from when Marine Force will be radiated out from, crushing the bandits like the criminals they are, and doing so will finally, at that long last, move to restore final order. The Father, from his first days on the earth, Pieter van Norden had been raised to believe that the purest life was a thoughtless life, that a pure life was all that matters. Born in Amsterdam just a year before the war, his childhood was molded by a world of radio programs and Hitler Youth counselors. A blitzkrieg of propaganda crashed through this wall of his mind, and day by day holding onto the past became harder and harder. By the time he landed a muscovine with a rifle on his back, he had firmly taken the easy way out. Yet grasping those fascist values and act up for more than mere convenience, as unthinkable as it was, Pieter's German uh, fluency, his Wehrmacht rank, his growing kill count, all those... All these gave him a meaning that his family and friends in Holland could not match. Those in the community were losers, chained to a corpse. Peter was a perfect Aryan soldier, contributing to a Reich that would outlast the state. The failed state it had absorbed. Eventually, Peter's service ended. With a shot to the shoulder, and he was asked to begin a new task, settling Ukraine. 
As a new idea to aspire to, Peter jumped at the opportunity quickly. He found himself a wife in the old flame of secondary school and rushed off to a homestead near Kiev to begin once more. Now he found his new routine, tilling and harvesting, waking at sunrise and sleeping at sunset. It was far from his urban life in Amsterdam, but Peter does it all the same. Perhaps if he stops, he might realize how far he's drifted from that all he knows, how lonely and empty his new lands feels, but he would not stop for thoughtless momentum is the way of the Reich, and Peter von Norden is the Reich's favorite son. Work and work forever, and have a big family. Bird basket action, okay. More, endless fields of grain, swaying in the breeze, golden brown and worked by the hundreds of men, still not enough. The Nazi official standing on the front porch of his plantation wanted more. More wheat, more barley, more everything, and Adolf had been struggling to keep up with the quota since the last time they were raised, being asked to make more was out of the question even for a farm the size of his. Sir, with all due respect, I don't think you understand. This farm can only produce so much grain, and I'm making as much as I can. I'm already working my slaves half to death trying to get them to meet the current demands, but the native farmhands not far behind. What you're asking for is impossible. I'm sure you'll manage to meet the quote, it's the same as everyone else, official said. Looking down his clipboard and scribbling a quick note, he looked up, giving Adolf a glassy stare. Is there anything else? Officer, I simply can't make these new quotas. If I push my field hands any harder, they're going to start dying in the fields as they work. And I suggest that you find some more. The officer clicked his pen and abruptly extended a single arm, offering a handshake while smiling coldly. Adolf took his hand, knowing better than to refuse an offer from a party official. Sir, I really think... It was a pleasant pleasure meeting you, Herr Adolf. He gave Adolf's hand a quick, a steel gripped shake before straightening his suit, and walking down the front steps of the porch, returning to his black Volkswagen. He walked down the uh, dirt trail that led to the farmstead, leaving nothing but a stone Adolf and towering clouds of dust in his wake. Always more. Um, so, let's look, look at this. So here, the red basket of the Reich. We have development progress. Shows how economically developed the region is, from agriculture to industry to infrastructure. Uh, and uh, region exploitation. Within a region, it indicates how much of the state's resources and potential have been thoroughly unearthed and utilized by the state to much of the people's dismay. At national level, it has effects. At a regional level, it also has more effects, too. So we can mechanize farms. Um, raise resource quotas. Brutal quotas. Development status. Further exploited by five. Experimental extractionist methods. Hmm. Keep. And then there's also resistance over here too. We have full control right now. Oh. Well, you know what? We have full control. Oh, uh, it depends on which each state though. Um. So control. So there's four different factions here. RKU. The Ukrainian Red Army, Ukrainian National Revolutionary Army, Ukrainian Surgeon Army. Um, various insurgents, partisans, and bandits surround the peace and stability of the ruling regime in Ukraine. Should the government's control fall under 50%, um, regional development uh, exploitation and grain output will be decreased. So, we have to keep it under wraps. So, in Ukraine, we're actually okay, or Kiev, we're okay. So, actually doing this wouldn't make any sense right now. Other regions, 75% control, 80%, 95%, 70%. A lot of commies over here, so. So, we just gotta wait and get there. On um, resistance activity. So, managing the numerous groups that are opposed to us is crucial if we are to succeed in our goals. In this interface, we can easily access information on these different groups by hovering over their names, as well as allowing us to monitor their effects on our state. Activity cycles are periods of time when, at their end, resistance groups will carry out operations which will apply effects on the different regions of Ukraine. Each resistance group is assigned to a decisive region which acts as their base of operations. A resistance group's control surpasses a certain threshold within the specified decisive region. The effects applied at the end of the activity cycle will be worse compared to if they do not surpass the threshold. The effects of each resistance groups can be seen by hovering over the exclamation mark to the right of each group. So it's pretty low overall, but we gotta keep that under check. But in the meantime, um, I would like to raise resource quotas, recognize farms, lose political power, and get more debt. Um, development increases though. Development further exploited by five. What do I mean by development advances or exploit? Is ex does exploiting development go down, or does that increase region exploitation? Because it gives us more growth, but loses loses uh, population. So I don't mind this one because you get more development, and increases state GDP. Sixty. Nice. Grain output's 9. And right now, we're 35. The stock of the grain at the end of the consumption cycle are as as follows. Up to 36 grain to be utilized by the cycle. Expect development 8 out of 9. We need one more development cycle here. We have a year until that. But the Reich, we need in total 42. The Reich needs 37. 
Grain Eater locally by Ukrainians is 42. So, we got to focus on that. Finish off Communal Farms. Slowly improve. Uh, yeah, we'll probably do this one. The agricultural land of Ukraine in and around the Dnieper are unsurprisingly some of the most viable and productive. The Great River provides ample irrigation, and in turn, the land provides nutrition for millions of the right citizens. But they operate on farming principles of centuries past and must be modernized if output is to be increased. Uh, they will be. Those farmers that accept the gifts given will be temp amply rewarded, and those who do not will be swiftly and uncompromisingly replaced. So full control, which is fine. Blood from a stone, one time tax development. Grants partisan control of every activity. Taxable population. Income tax for a certain amount of days. Oh my Ukraine. Cast down and beaten, her fields lie a follow. Her son's blood chokes on oh my Ukraine. Repress or strangle it. Those who let this uh, happen, those who wish it to happen, cry as it rips out their mother's heart and spill the blood of the brothers. Oh my Ukraine, cast down and betrayed. And by Daniel Nosenko, 1962. Skip holdings. Uh, as the campaign of modernization, reform, and improvement of Ukrainian agriculture for the betterment of the Reich continues, decisions must be made on where to allocate resources. Those decisions are simple. The NOC, operating as it does, does not need state funds to create improvement, and thus will not be given to them. The cooperatives are, will, and must be for the focus of the administration's efforts, for they are, at least, directly controlled by it, which is something that cannot be said about the NOC. Master and Servant. Uh, so just sort of invest in industrial development. Why don't we just maximize Kiev? Development increases advances by ten. Increases state GDP. That's nice. Can we get any more grain from them? I don't know. I, I don't know if we hold on to it or not. So. Master servant, the old manner of Georg Leibrandt lacked the corrupt decadence of his fellow bureaucrats, but it held splendor all on its own. Facing the northern shores of the Black Sea, the manor was beautiful and stark, a symbol for the Bismarckian standard of bureaucracy which Leibrandt had held himself to at all times. Leibrandt was so rarely took days off that the manor had become sort of a vacation home for him, a space to clear his head when the menageries or meager stresses of deputizing grew too great. In the past months, Leibrandt required such escapes increasingly often. Uh, oh, I'm close like this. The Reich's commissariat was failing, and no matter how many desks he pounded on or people he yelled at, a uh, few of his subordinates rose to even the basic competence. Seeing his old house reminded him of the better times, both real and imagined, in the face of an increasingly grim future. The deputy took a, mount, a moment to admire the sweeping fields of his estate. Ukraine, his home, and stretched out beyond. And national socialism should have saved it, purged it of all of his racial deficiencies and Judeo Bolshevik masters. Lipped into the new age. Uh, instead, unthinkable beasts like Eric Koch forced him back into squalor. Lebron had so many plans, so many ideas, that he would likely join his country in the dirt before a single one was enacted. Uh, Lebron sighed. As he approached his front door, a group of Ukrainian servants skittered about, preparing for his entrance. Lebron turned to one and snapped, Do you do you feel that there is something wrong with the Reich's commissar? I'd answer honestly. Servant froze, Of course not, Lebron. Hitler, the slave of Ukraine, made it pu pure. Lebron scoffed at the servant, If you're not going to tell the truth, take my coat to my office. I'll be writing. The servant obeyed, re relieved that the situation did not escalate any further. As we do have some units here. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to utilize them. We're all going to go circle Ukraine right now. Or, I keep calling it Ukraine. It's just the capital, Kiev. Blood from a stone. Well, I want to reap the harvest, but at the same time, uh, I don't want this one. Partisan control every activity chance. So we're going to reinforce the strongholds next then. Deputy Fuhrer, drafts of a letter piled around the DPD at Lebrun's desk, a result of hours of feverish writing. Finally drained of his endless urge to write, he had turned a decaying atlas to in the shelves. Aged from almost 30 years of use, slowly, reverently, he admired the 23rd page, a map of Ukraine. It was a book that Lebrun, head of the Ost Ministerium decades prior, first conceived of the Reichskommissariat, of its divisions, of its demographics, and its leadership in its planes. It was supposed to be a transitory stage or something better, more stable, more free instead. Lebron was rejected and his delicate system was transformed or more accurately allowed to degrade into a system as unstable and brittle as the Soviet Union that preceded it. Even now, when given a second chance, Germania seemed doomed to make the same mistake. In his hands, Lebron held the latest draft of the letter he had been endlessly rewriting at the header. The letter of resignation, it gave him a perverse joy to consider the thought. 
Imagine Cock fuming as his hands fell with drudgery, which Lebrun always did, and instead regretting it rather than dismiss this vital piece of the Reich's commissariat. Lebrun, healthy and healthy, finally at rest. Rest! A great wave of guilt came to Lebrun, waking him from his fantasy. To be considered resignation was shameful, a disgrace to his race and intelligence. National Socialism was a savior, leader, and master. It shows utility to the Third Reich, no matter how much it protested. Complained or fought back, it was his duty, for Ukraine had to be saved, and the gunmen. From behind the crest of the hill, Baldin crouched. Where to take the shot? Behind him, two other partisans stood, waiting for it to kill. A car, painted black and adorned with German symbols, had just appeared. Let's close him up now. Baldin fired. The glass of the car cracked, and the slumped, bloody head of the driver smashed on the steering wheel. The car careened off the road, and the other partisans finished to move to finish their work. From his vantage, Baldin could not see what his compatriots did next, but he heard the fire of the guns and the high-pitched crash of shattering windows. The mission was complete. As the rest pulled the bodies from the vehicle, Baldin walked towards the car, now a wreck on the side of the road. His eyes met with the driver's vacant stare. He was face most bloody now. His skull cracked. He wore civilian clothes with a watch on his arm. He had a small patch on his lapel, designing his race. He was Ukrainian. Bodan turned away. Bill with an ugly mixture of disgust and shame. The man was no comrade, of course, but he was no settler. A word of possible lie flew into Bodan's head. Possible realities of the man he had killed. Possible reasons he might have ended up a fascist servant. Bodan turned from the car and began marching back up the hill, ready to, to return home. Jimmy's roots are growing, and he thought to himself. No matter how many died, their replacements only seemed to grow more comfortable, dug further and further into the soil, sustained by a deluge of Ukrainian blood. <sighs> the merchant cheated. Another day of passing meant more hours wasted dealing with good-for-nothing, blathering idiots calling themselves his subordinates. God, but Eric Cock was tired of all of this. This time, who was it? Peter Schulte Herima, the money-grubbing leech the Dutch had put at the head of the NOC. Uh, Cock hated Herima, uh, Herima, but he did as he did most of his subordinates, but Herima carried a certain uniqueness in terms of the kind of annoyance he posed to the Reich's Commissar. He could solve himself by having to deal with Herima. Cock and private conversation were replaced Schulte Herima and Peter Schulte Herima with girl noises. This was his impression of the Dutch language. Oh, crap. Bitching the nose of his, uh, the bridge of his nose. Cock shook his head and said his chin. No, absolutely not. We're not going to spend any money to let your little NCO mechanize its farms during our Dnieper mechanization campaign. Not a single thing. Offending. The very suggestion is insane. But Herr Axkomasar, I can assure that NOC participation in this project will be beneficial. Shut up. You're nothing more than an overambitious leech on the Axkomasarat. In fact, if I was concerned of your Aryan bloodline, I'd say you're actually a Jewish Bolshevik capitalist spy for the Americans. The contradiction of the insult was not apparent to Cock or even Harima. Continue on. Continuing on. The Axkomasar shot over Harima's objections. No, that's it. Get out this instant. Third phase of General Plan Ost will be updated and finalized. Third phase of the General Plan Ost and sort of laws. Support the Gendarmerie. Hey, more stability would be nice. Let's give us stability? No. Remind diplomats of Hitler's decree. Unfortunately, as it may be to rely on such subhumans, we cannot rule with Aryans alone. This is Shuma. Our native auxiliary police are native are necessary to maintain order in the vast ocean of Slavic subhumanity existing beyond a few Aryanized strongholds. A city of a string of defections, desertions, and losses to banish us steadily chipped away their number. But this will be no problem. We do not seek to ask for recruits we may simply take. The only thing standing between their order and lawlessness is their gendarmerie, and every subhuman auxiliary killed by its bandits is an Aryan that does not have to be in its place. So, we're going to keep developing that area. Hmm... 20 development. Hey, we're 37. It's pretty good. I want to keep it close to you here. Reichenaustadt. Yeah. We need more infantry equipment, that's not good. So I guess we're really just going to focus on a lot of guns. So we can't do anything about this anyway, so we might as well even look at it right for now. Development, development. So let's take a look here before we do anything else. So we want Reichenaustadt. So more control there would be nice. Stability. Here we get Reichenaustadt by five. And in Kiev and Volnyan. I how you pronounce it? Volnyan? I oh, don't know. Desolation rises. So I just don't want to develop areas that will be automatically developed, anyways. This place is not bad. I don't want brutal quotas. Uh, mechanized farms are fine enough. That's good. 
38, we're getting there. Remind diplomats of Hitler's decree. No, we deny that there are many problems in the Ukraine, not the least of which are fractures in our administration brought about by political indecisiveness. The creatures from the foreign ministry think, think to give instructions to the officials and thereby confuse any response, but no longer. The fear decreed decades ago that the political direction and organization of Ukraine was still the business of the Eastern Ministry. And we'll remind them of this, as firstly as required. That's not good. Uh, that's not good either. God dang it. A bureaucrat's bureaucrat. Hans Otto Abrathagam unlocked the door to his office and walked in. It was dark. The only light coming from the rising sun's dim rays I slipped through the aluminum of many blinds. Hans slid his hand across the wall looking for the next light switch, flipping it upwards as he found it. His office was now illuminated. The young bureaucrat sat down at his desk, placing his coffee upon a coaster and pulling up his sleek new typewriter. For the next few hours, uh, the only so the sound of the work could be heard from Abrathagam's office. While other older officials in the foreign ministry or office arrived late, Chatted with secretaries for hours and left long, for long lunches, Hans never left his desk. The name Brautigam was not a new one of the Reichs Commissariat. Hans' uncle was the previous representative of the foreign office. Officer. Uh, having left the colony for a minor lucrative job as one of Theodor Oberländer's allies in the Reichstag as he left, Georg Lebrandt rose to the position of deputy, leaving the post a representative of the foreign office open. Why did he leave a finger in the Ukrainian pot? Otto recommended his nephew to the position. Nepotism at his finest, of course. Except while well, most relatives and elite... Given a job in the bureaucracy with laser about their posts, Hans worked feverishly. In his mind, he had all that to prove. He had been given a once in a lifetime opportunity to make a change in the Reich's trouble breadbasket, a change his uncle was too cowardly to make himself. Hans finally allowed himself to take a break. Standing up to stretch his legs, he hooked a finger up on the window blinds and pulled down, looking to the smog choked skyline of Kiev. Young Hans, approached by his 31st birthday, imagined that eventually he would become head of this colony, probably not anytime soon, but someday after that. He showed Germany that the people of Ukraine are worth more than his brothers, than his slaves. A good man or a naive fool? I don't see any options here, so... The mother. In appearance, Antonia van Norden was a distinctly airy woman. Her eyes were pale blue, not striking, but always pleasant. Her hair grew blonde and straight, a shining waterfall that when it was not forced into a bun at the top of her head. Her limbs were long and slender, elegant and worthy. In the past life, it was beauty that had brought her a life of her own. Before the market crashed, Antonia spun in a whirlwind of suitors and advantages, adventures. An endless party in the streets of Amsterdam. It all ended with Peter, with the one man strong enough to finally pin her down. Ukraine was a new life, a quieter life. It was calmer here. She woke up, kissed her husband good morning, and began to cook a hearty breakfast. She walked into the town to buy some supplies and returned in time to help with the weeding. She heard a story to Marcus, kissed her husband goodnight, and crashed into her bed. Yet deep in her mind, Ukraine was destroying her. Her hair was growing faded and frizzier. Her eyes began to sink into a web of crow's feet and bags. A thin layer of muscle growing. Uh, from all the time she spent in the field, she spent far too long in the bathroom, staring into the mirror, she could feel herself rotting. Before she slept each night, she prayed her family could not tell. <coughs> so we're out. Oh, we actually have plenty of guns now. Okay, let's go look-see. So we've done this a whole lot, and we got to make sure we get a more grain and whatnot, but resistance is also a problem. Hugens Dwarf, huh? So we want to arm the police. Because control has gone down. Regional desolation, huh? Raid bandit bases. So we get 2% here. We get 3.5% here. And down here, cracked on a bandit tree. 80% chance we get 5%. And desolation rises by 5. How do we lower desolation? Fifty percent chance we raise desolation by four. Five percent chance uh, we lose control and get even more desolation and lose the state GDP. Well, let's save it real quick. Eighty percent chance is still pretty good. That will do fine. But let's see if we can actually do anything here about it. So Eighty percent chance. Five percent more. Desolation went up by four, and we lost that chance. Well, that sucks. <laughs> Um, finish up the third phase of the GPO. Our administration owes its fundamental existence to the auspices of General Plan Ost, having been organized to execute its stipulations in Ukraine. And so we must adhere to the directives imparted to us. Our actions in recent years have held true to this, and we are, at long last, able to move towards moving, finishing its third phase. Final administrative goals will be completed. Suitable reports will be made, and doing so will prove the success of our mission. Prove that Ukraine has held true to the Rex goals above all others. Crack down on the termites. Despite years of efforts at securing Ukraine, it remains the truth that bandits still infest forests, swamps, mountains, and yet cities of the state. Displaced soldiers, rebellious peasants, abject criminals, and more fleet justice and pillage of countryside with impunity. 
This must stop, and there's only one man can be considered to be responsible. Ollendorf and the SS, other SS units under his command must be charged with organizing police operations to fight the, and suppress the bandits and return order to the countryside. Otherwise, what is their purpose? Art is dead and they killed it. Halnya, hunched over a box in the cellar. I read the last two words of the poem and the next signature of the author. Ironically, for a poet, it was messy chicken scratch, but Halnya already knew what it said by handwriting alone. Danyo Nosenko. She abandoned what I had initially brought her there, a search for the old sewing kit, and headed back up the stairs, leaving the basement turned upside down. Grinding, she approached her husband with a purpose she hadn't felt in ages. She was He was characteristically buried deep in the book in the kitchen. He lowered the tone slightly to get a look at his wife, who presented the poem to him. You wrote this, Daniel? Daniel gently took the crinkled little paper and ran his eyes over it. He curled, his lips curled into a bittersweet smile. You liked it then, huh? Liked it, Daniel. It's the greatest I've ever read, replied Hanya. I never thought it stood out from the rest of my work, said Daniel Lowe. Uh, Daniel Lowe. Just specifically pressing it aside, he could tell what his wife was getting at just by the look in her eye and embraced for the coming words. I think it's just powerful. I thought about contacting one of your old friends in the underground, getting it published. People need to hear this now more than ever. Daniel removed his glasses, shutting his eyes to rub his nose, revisualizing the lifeless faces of dozens too idealistic to live. Shame, fear, and grief boiled in his chest. I'm sorry, my love, but I can't risk it. Don't you remember what happened to Maxime? The right kills men for things like this, and we have to face that world they've created for as no place for art. They would never know, Daniel. Someone always does here, Hanya. The diplomat rebuked. This is too much for Aircock to bear. Uh, some good-for-nothing diplomat, a nephew of some big man in the East, was gaining influence here, of all places. Obviously, that had to be contained before he attempted to negotiate the po uh, Polisian banners or some other such nonsense. And I'm telling you, Brautigam, that the fear ruled long ago that the new lands in the East, such as this Reichskommissariat, are not at all a concern to the Foreign Office. And you start with all this babble reform, all he's doing is gumming up the wheels of this administration and giving the bandits and traders outside an easier time. The little whelp kept babbling and cock cock scowled. Darn nation, he'd hoped that calling on this name of Hitler as it would violate the First Commandment to do so would have helped. No, I don't give a gosh darn about it. No, absolutely not. No. No, 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 no. Don't you even think of continuing this line of talk. Get back to work or else you have a real problem. Cock cursed the children of the party member officials for what felt like the 70th time that year. Naive idiots with the Jesus ideas, I swear to God, under a shadow. Rarely would Otto Ollendorf venture beyond the comfort and sanity of his own office, for he knew exactly what awaited him outside the scattered bastions of national, so national socialism he called home. Memories. How This, however, was very important. It was imperative that Ollendorf was here, even if every fire of his being demanded his return to sanctity. Gunfire echoed through the streets a block away, far from Kiev. How the UPA managed to get a foothold on the city like this was simple. Thought the authorities surrounding him assured him that they could not have known how something like this would have come to pass. Now they controlled two apartment complexes and were taking a pot shot to the police. Criminal Polizei, specifically. Apparently, it was the Sipo's off day, and it was starting to show in the four wounded men crying on the streets. The sheer pool of blood which soaked the clothing continued to spread along the filthy concrete, and the spread of gunfire from the windows sparked a rotting feeling in Ollendorf's guts. Now, of course, it had come to this. He has had his ethics been followed by Noska, then perhaps such things would not be happening within his jurisdiction. Of course, such a word as ethics never found its way into the stain of Ollendorf's Einsatzkommando. Raising his binoculars, Ollendorf made out the silhouettes of three rebel riflemen, all clad in black fatigues and red patch red black patches. It seemed fitting that wherever Ollendorf fled, the SS looked close behind, like a bad memory he just couldn't shed. Herr Untersturmfuhr placed Raffelman in those windows there, and Ollendorf pointed to the buildings opposite to the complexes and eliminated the men with the caps before those with the helmets, until the Orpo to get its crap together. So now we have a little bit more, and we actually did uh, hit here. We did crack down a bandry down here, so we have more control now. I think. Or actually we did over here. 81%, yeah. No more desolation, but whatever. Arm the police will be good to do. But I still want more development. Um, experimental methods, huh? So this will grow advanced by 20, exploited by 5. That's fantastic. Raise resource quotas. Grows it by five. Ten. So what happens if we max it out? So how high can grain output get? That's my question. In each place. Can you go up to ten? Can you go higher than ten? Grain output has not changed. Maybe 9 is the highest level we can get. Skill 1 and 10. Increase in value. With, oh, when it reaches 100. So we're at 95 here. 
And we'll go up to five by five more. So maybe we should max out Kiev next. Approval quotas, we're gonna wait for that one. We still have, we still have this here too. Full control, which is good. I don't like how much activity there is right there. There you go. Of course, with this one next. Humble the self righteous Prussian. It seemed the haughty posturing of the shoot stop was an issue all even all the way out here among the fields and crops of the Reich's bread basket. <coughs> Ollendorf seemed to have the ideas in his head, reaching far beyond his station, convincing himself that he was instrumental to the success of a settlement campaign during the GPO's third phase. Such a thing was only possible due to the providence of our dear Rex Commissar a cock, not that effeminates of the SS are ever wise enough to recognize this. It would be very much in the best interest of Ollendorf that his real responsibilities be insisted upon, therefore. After all, plenty of honors will have to be won in the culling of the partisans, or at least enough to shut him up that he does not try to steal credit for Cock's triumphs out from under him. The commander. The sun had set hours ago, and the fire was going out. The other soldiers had been returning to their encampments, but Bolden had been ordered to stay. He wasn't sure why he watched the last embers fall and waited for his next command. Out of the darkness, the division's commander spoke, his voice powerful, yet only as loud as needed. Bolden, I am concerned about your recent conduct. Your comrades have complained you've been eating up little, and rarely speaking with them. They say you seem to have forgotten the cause. Bolden took a long time to speak. I'm fine, I promise. I remain dedicated. I have devoted myself to our every mission as I'm accurate with the rifle as ever. Well, then I'm no zealot, but I do believe a man is a soul. I've seen it burning in the heat of battle. A soul cannot survive off pride in one's work alone. It needs hope. If you do not truly believe in the cause, sooner or later your soul will fail you and you will waver. Bolan spoke quickly. I would never betray the cause, Commander, I promise. The Commander gave a slight smile. Even the last glimpse of light. Bolan could see his commander's weariness, I believe you, but when the light returns tomorrow morning, take some time to read. Let him. A good soldier knows what to fight for. The final embers crackled as the Commander returned to his quarters. Pretty good. I kind of like, I love this G GUI mechanics, just, we're trying to make this better for everybody. Oh, we get more grain output if we were to increase output from other places, like here. But I'd rather focus on the few select areas first. Desolation is non-existent, which is great. I can't do anything here anyway, so, oh, look at that. Did it actually go down? It actually went down. Nice. I love it. Um, so we're going to leave that one alone. You, uh, 75 is probably better to do, but I want Ukraine... Keep saying Ukraine. Uh, this area would be better. More growth. Exploitation's okay. Less population growth. Oh, so we have it already at level 10. So for the development level of this place, 1 to 10. An increase of this value will be recorded when a region's development reaches 100. So we have it 100%. I mean, so there's no point in increasing it any further then, I guess. I guess I shouldn't have increased it then. Ah, we're all learning here. Lighting the torches. You want to see me? Ivan Dubzia's voice was very uh, very weary as the door gently shut behind him. The corridor of light from the hallway closed it with him, leaving him and Yuri Horlas in the dim glow of his desk lamp in the unassuming office. He offered a half smile and nodded. Yes, come in. I think we both know what this is about, the Horlas answered. The last few words, his smile faded. I believe it's time to make her move. This is the perfect storm we've been waiting for. He tried not to look pl uh, pleased at the prospect of his proposal. He certainly wasn't giddy, but the thought of progress still brought him satisfaction. I was hoping this would uh, be about that. In fact, I was to suggest the very same. Rarely do we get a situation where the people are so angry and the government is so weak. Others have been talking about it too. I suppose we're getting tired of just taking bites out of the fascists. Uh, most don't sign on with the resistance movement to not resist anything, and I have to share the sentiment. Well, rest assured they'll be getting their revolution soon. Both men went silent. Trying to reconcile the gravity of the matter with the gratification of finally finding their chance to strike. It certainly wasn't a dour occasion, but anything above would be in poor taste, not to mention the fear and failure always tagged along behind hope for success. Dubia uh, tapped his knees with his fingers and said, So what's next? Pack, we gotta head to Brest to inform the rest of the leaders, making sure that's unanimous, and then get organizing. I'll be there. And the committee inner grasped. Only a fool would ever think it's possible to displace the Ukrainians entirely from some form of governance over the slam. There's so many of them after all. The Ukrainian National Committee will always exist and should always be empowered, but will not, cannot operate independently. The security police and SD will be tasked with maintaining oversight and overwatch, cultivating informants and otherwise ensuring that we are well aware of the committee's actions and intentions, which we will provide to them regardless. Our collaborators can do with some support, but we will not let them entertain any, any independent ideas. Powerless Ukrainian National Committee will update and supervise the Ukrainian National Committee in our sort of laws. Answering the call. Vasil Stus examined the sheet of paper in front of him, which was as blank as a stare. He had been trying to write something down for the past hour, but focusing was virtually impossible between the chill of the room and the surfacing news. 
His head had been subwimming, drowning more accurately ever since Horlus had been made his intentions clear and the word spread of Galicia and the Undra in the whispers. It was time for them to act and stood to lead. The future never felt so immediate, and even if the future was one he was looking forward to, the steps to it were unclear and uneven. And putting his thoughts on paper usually helped him in that his profession after all, but he was too caught up in his own mind. He was too, too distracted with his work, or lack thereof, to notice Taras Borovet's third knock at his door. Nevertheless, it gave him another go, which started startled Sebastian's attention. All right, come in. He said, shuffling his papers to the side. Borovets stepped inside, his brow furrowed as he registered Susa's ex anxious expression. Nerves, he asked as he claimed his seat. I expect you to be excited, frankly. The firebrand you are. Come, let's see how uh, uh, we can be of use to this cause. A bit of fire returned to Susa's eyes. I figure we would recruitment and strengthen the propaganda front. Get the whole people ready to act and save Ukraine. I trust you have plans for the military side of things. Some higher recruitment than, like you and uh, said, and more aggressive actions, perhaps set to work with some proper military discipline. Seems like there is a much need for discussion, then. I'll meet with our organizers. You meet your man, and we'll go to setting and waging our little war. Simple enough in the sun. Marcus von Norden was a lovely child with a button nose and curly blonde hair. He was quiet and helpful. Adept at following orders like his father and skilled at avoiding discomfort like his mother. His heart was wide and shallow, ready to be fulfilled filled by those around him. He only rarely cried. Antonia often worried when he may grow sullen. Nervously, uh, she scouted the neighbor for possible friends and found few children that Peter would accept. She looked into Marcus's eyes and saw a great abyss, and one, one which needed to be filled as soon as the family could allow. Peter fretted over his weakness, over the child's small arms and wobbling step. The Reich had great expectations for his children, both their role and abilities. Marcus could not be left behind by his nation. When he saw his children cry, or child cry, Peter could barely exist in that moment. He could only imagine the great emptiness of a man who could not serve their nation or aid their family. Marcus took, understood none of this. He looked up to his family and saw them as pure. He could see no other possibility. He fussed with toys and ate his dinners and took a little note of the nervous glances his parents always seemed to share. Only years later did he come to understand his years in the farmhouse. Where are we at now? Oh. Oh, we went to level, to level, level two. Interesting. Ah. So it actually went up. So when does it happen when that goes up? Oh, maybe at the end of the month? Nine out of nine. Do a total of nine development levels by the end of the cycle. That's fantastic. Amazing, even. We continue to crush them. It costs 50 manpower. Full control is what we like. It was dropped down to 75%. That's not good. Um, I hate how many commies are here. So, but maybe we just do this one here, too. Um, just so that... Uh, get rid of the commies. I'd love to get rid of the commies here. You know what, we're going to save again. If it doesn't go well, well, we'll find a place to make sure we do well. So. So, 80% chance it goes up by 5. It didn't go up by 5. God dang it. That really sucks. <laughs> Shovels. The shovel was heavier in Halnia's hand than she was used to. She wondered to herself if the man that she was getting older or hungrier. Probably both, she thought. Bear buying new equipment for the farm was always a pain, stealing her scant savings away from her and sending her on an unwieldy truck home. Her day continued to worsen, not just from the relentless icy rain that turned the dirt road home to muck, but additionally the flock of people crowding one of the few paved roads in town. As she neared, she heard a sound that made her blood boil. A German marching tune, coupled with a malevolent growl of truck engines. The ominous grinding of a tank treads and uneasy scattered applause from the weary crowd. With no way around, she waded through the throng to the curb where she could see the rather pathetically sized parade. Four or five tanks, perhaps two platoons of men, a few outdated and rusted old trucks, and a military band that was struggling to breach the noise of the vehicles. Around her, the crowd was clapping, some with genuine intensity and others with staff, stilted insincerity. A man with behind her nudged her, encouraging her to join him. She shook her head, gesturing to her shovel, unable to leave. Her anger only further simmered. It was nothing but a march of walking memories of walking nightmares. The pace evoked the first march into the little town so long ago, the way they let the curtains fall on their home and suffocated into misery. The faces reminded her of the way she, they had spat on her and her people every day of their lives. So chating yet pride. Worst of all, the trucks reminded her of Daniel's rare stories of the camp, for some old friend turned collaborator had bailed him out. She thought of her scars, like an abused animal. She was glad he was at home, not here. Obscenities tried to climb up her throat, so she bit her tongue. Violence crossed her mind, and how satisfying it would be to let the Nazi teeth fly with a shovel. She couldn't do that. She couldn't make Daniel a widower. She had all he had. Instead, she grinned until the last man passed and walked home muttering, Scum! Laying out the welcome man. Are you sure currents are enough, Alexander? As Volomir Bahitsi, Bahitsi, as he closed the aforementioned blinds, the gray breast street vanishing outside the behind the curtain or cloth. It's the curtains of Volomir. I'd like to think that you're not reducing my efforts to curtains. I found the most excluded meeting room in the building and found the rest of the movement back doors to get in. 
about Alexander Alderblin. So I wouldn't call it just curtains. I think we'll be fine. It doesn't feel that covert to be doing this in a Rex Commissariat meeting room in the heart of Brest, no less, contested Bahazi. Ah, those Germans are too busy with their squabbling and riots to notice a little meeting like this. You really don't need to be as cautious as you are, old friend. I, Alderblin, was interrupted as a small gaggle of resistance leaders fell into the room, followed by several more just until uh, every man was there, exchanging greetings from the cart to the friendly. The room was consumed by the dull murmur of conversation, most esteemed of the guests, and many handshakes and warm welcomes was Yuri Horlis. The men slid into their seats around the table, the room was certainly showing its age, from the peeling wallpaper to the coffee stains on every surface. Still, uh, expressions of hope rested on the faces of a gathered between the occasion and clear a cough. Good evening, gentlemen, said Horlis. In an instant, there was silence. I'd like to thank you for attending, and our friends Volodymyr and Alexander for wrapping this room, because the time finally has come. The time had come for action, for the turn of prosperity of the Ukraine. With that, he began to spin his yarn to deliver a speech with hope and a plan in close. He was hoping both become a reality. The hatchet man blunted. You, Herr Alexander, think absolutely too much of yourself for your own good. Herr Kock, Rex Commissar of Ukraine, was pointing at Otto Ollendorf, head of the local SS from his seated position behind his desk. I don't care what your role of your black shirts or whatever had in the filming of, what was it, uh, yes, phase three of General Plan Ost. I think your men are the best off sitting around and cooling their heels for the next few months lest they try anything funny or forget that whatever successes they think they've had are anything other than thanks to the Rex Commissariat's work as a bulwark of Aryan race. Uh, Ollendorf was grimacing. Yes, party comrade, uh, of course I agree, but... But, but, don't you th agree? But nothing. That's a contradiction in terms. Don't you think I don't see you trying to divert the conversation or take credit for what was essentially my work? Go focus on fighting the partisans and make yourself useful. What was it that your boss back said at home? Said at home? We only want their fear? A uh, hesitant nod from Ollendorf. Well, if you screwers give the band of partisans reason to fear, maybe we wouldn't be in this mess in the first place. Look at this. Repressing the urge to do something he might soon regret, Ollendorf merely nodded again. As you say, party comrades, at that cock gestured at the door dismissively, as I say, indeed, get back to work and a purpose unending. Outside of Kharkiv, there was a sorrowing group of dilapidated factories, empty and deemed hazardous and unusable by the German authorities. Most of its workers were dead, killed by the many famines that the city had experienced. Fled west or into the swamps or simply went as most did into the hollow and emaciated remnants, remnants of the city. Anything useful had been pilfered, uh, pilfered, leaving the rest to rust and crumble to be viewed only from a distance and yet another meaningless ruin amongst what was once a bustling, bustling metropolis. Within the snow-covered ruins or structures were, were must was the smell and empty coldness of a tomb was the site lay the last remnant of the Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic. Alexandra Shumsky's face was only illuminated by the single gas lamp, while his office of iron sheets and curtains remained dark and obscure. Shumsky's eyes slowly moved to the next paper in his pile. He missed music. That would make it better in living this dungeon and lighting the rimless drudgeries. Shumsky picked up yet another paper report. Scenes of devastation, char bodies, crushed skulls, burning homes, and burned churches. A retaliation expedition, the report said. Shumsky had seen it all, not just in pictures. He hated it to admit it, but he thought it all stale now. Women and children, even that note, could not break his heart any further. What had the raid that had prompted this massacre accomplished? A few rifles and boxes of bullets already at the cost of ten men. Shumsky felt his uh, surroundings grow colder. This couldn't go on. Crewman was non-existent, and the younger generation cared for more for the next handful of bread than freedom. No Shumsky strain. The raid may have ended in massacre, but that only proved that if their oppression continues, death would be their fate. Those men had died in vain. Those bullets would pierce the brains of murders and their countrymen. Shumsky was sure as of that as, as he ever was. All we have now is hope, blood from a stone. The many reforms and improvements necessary within Ukraine are, unsurprisingly, very expensive to implement. It's both unrealistic and unfair that the Reich be expected to pay for them. And so this burden will be placed on the Ukrainians themselves, after all, are our actions not being undertaken to benefit these lands and their output? There will be a reason, uh, reasonable exception, of course, as the Reich is nothing if not merciful. Sick, elderly, and disabled persons will be exempt, uh, but everyone else will pay, and that payment will be enforced, of course. And well, now we have 30 here as well. So we're focusing on the core here, a whole bunch. So we need at least one more grain to mate the, so we don't get a famine here at all, which would be really bad if we do get a famine, so. We're trying to avoid a famine. As the economy is like pooping itself, yeah, the GDP is going up, inflation is going up, but so is debt GDP ratio, which sucks. The old commissar, Andrea Lichtevsky, had been anxiously waiting for a safe house near the border of the German occupied Milo uh, Mikhailov for hours before a frenzied announcement of success from the partisan detachment in the city came over the radio. When the operation had been suggested, at a spur of the moment, most of the Central Committee had been apprehensive about him, except for him, and his success had seemingly vindicated his view. That for all of his material advantages, the German occupation administration was vulnerable. 
New confidence, he turned to the secretary, Vasil Drozdenko. Send the word, Drozdenko quickly went to work, compiling a list of the dizzying array of underground partisan groupings. Clandestine exile circles and a secret factory cells that would need to be contacted in order to reconvene the party as a cohesive organization capable of commanding a new revolution. He saw a bit of himself and the younger man, Drozdenko. Drozdenko was not particularly sophisticated in his understanding of Marx or Lenin, but he had devo devotion, energy, and willpower required of the professional revolutionary. Not that Pisotsky lacked those qualities. He was old now, but the past 20 years had done nothing to dim his convictions from his own time in the U.S. DRP organ organizing a revolution against the puppet Hetmanat. In the closing days of the First World War, the deforming the UKP was out of disgust at Petyura's decreasing conservatism. To the, Lenin's, the lessons Lenin and Skripink had impressed on him, to his fights with the Russian chauvinists and the Union, Andrei Wojciechowski had come to view his life as a singularly devoted one task. There could be no decay, no compromise, no corruption of the goals of the revolution. He was ensure this at any cost. A party like any other political party strives after political domination for itself in Vesel und Menyak. As Andrei Milnik took to his podium, a blaring horde melody burst from a pair of loudspeakers behind him once more. It was at Lebron's insistence that the Reich's anthem played before each official meeting as a good reason to, for backroom dealings as any. Horst Veselid was an ugly, tired march and owed to the man who died a thousand miles from Kiev, yet every note was drilled into the chairman's head. It was an embarrassment. How had Milnik become so weak, so able to fall in line? Konovalets, O-U-N, took independence at first principle as first man. It is a spirit that appeared untamable under Melnyak and it lost everything, its beliefs, its independence, even its name. Subsumed by the Ukrainian National Committee that O-U-N was a mere, left a mere fraction, doomed to eternally rubber stamp whatever whims Labrat most has felt deserved an audience. One of his followers still maintained a degree of control. Shishko's influence on the UNA made him irreplaceable. Uh, Stitsiborsky's plans envisioned a free Ukrainian nation that most had forgotten. Shutil fought for the Ukrainian people in ways that the rest of the Melnyk's followers were too cowardly to attempt. None escaped their station. At the end of the day, they still listened to the same anthem, and then one by one they threw their hands in salute to the Reich and to the Fuhrer, so every soldier who tried to slay the Ukrainian people, an ocean of hands rising above a doomed nation. And Melnyk had no choice but to join them. Reap the harvest. Ukraine hasn't always been the most manageable territory to pacify, but the rewards have been worthwhile. The cities are secure, the natives know their place, our enemies are irrelevant and are and determined. Juno Plan Os proceeds smoothly and on schedule, and none of it would, be, been, would have been possible if it weren't for the efforts of our wise, attentive, and notable Rex Commissar Eric Koch. Considering all he's done for us, we can all agree that he deserves a nice, long vacation to East Prussia. Have a safe trip, Rex Commissar. When he returns, we can get to the real fun, startled with a bang. But we're going to end the episode there. If you enjoyed the first episode of us playing as Rex Commissar at Ukraine, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see what else we can do with Rex Commissariat and hopefully not explode. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.